So very warm welcome to everyone. Um, I'm happy that, to see you here, that you came after a very long day today and after a very beautiful dinner last night. And so we will talk about the responsible artificial intelligence, ethics, governance and policy. And artificial intelligence at the moment, it is everywhere. Everybody is talking about it. We also see a lot of applications in many different uh, areas, starting, uh, for example, from education to health, and then also areas such as transport and military. And almost every field, every area that uh, we can think of is affected, is using some artificial intelligence. And there are also a lot of discussion of uh, future potential uses and prospects of artificial intelligence in many different different applications and if we just think about our own everyday lives we can think of many examples where we use already artificial intelligence. At the same time also artificial intelligence is very much uh, contested. Uh, it uh, is very divides opinions very much. Uh, there are people who talk uh, and uh, think a lot about benefits of artificial intelligence and there are also major concerns, major ethical concerns uh, and social concerns about this technology. And in many ways, this is very uh, relevant for many topics of this workshop, also for many topics uh, which were discussed already yesterday. Uh, so artificial intelligence raises major ethical questions. It also raises major questions about responsibility. Uh, artificial intelligence is also relevant in human brain project because human brain project is working on artificial intelligence including also on social and ethical aspects of artificial intelligence and in the next year it's the plans to do even much more on artificial intelligence so many reasons to talk about it and what do we do within uh, during the next hour so we will start with the question what is artificial intelligence and then also talk about potential benefits uh, about the many concerns and what could the governance and policy do about it. Uh, we will talk about uh, a fourth industrial revolution, uh, what kind of ideas come from this framework. Uh, we will talk about European Union policy on artificial intelligence. Uh, we will talk about collaboration and competition in this new technology field. And at the end, we also have, a, we will have a movies. So as I saw yesterday, everybody likes movies a lot. Usually I put movies when I get a proper academic slot of 90 minutes. Uh, I thought that 60 minutes might be a bit short for squeezing in movies, but if everyone likes movies, we will get movie. But before we get to the movie, we have to do some uh, work uh, and think about some of these questions uh, that I have put in here. So before I start uh, talking, I have to also probably mention that there are many ways to approach artificial intelligence and how we approach it, it might also um, be based very much on what kind of uh, our own background and experience and expertise is. And I have to say my main expertise and my main work and research teaching and engagement is in areas of political science, European studies, also policy related work and uh, work related to science and technology studies. And these are lenses which I use uh, looking on emerging technologies uh, and uh, artificial intelligence is one of emerging technologies which uh, has also some similarities but also important differences from previous emerging technologies that we know such as for example nanotechnology, such as information and communication technologies. Uh, and uh, so these are some of uh, uh, things in background how we approach in uh, this particular case uh, artificial intelligence. So and let's start with this very uh, basic uh, question. Uh, everybody is talking about artificial intelligence. There are also many uses of it. What is artificial intelligence? So any ideas? Any keywords, concepts that come to your mind when you see artificial intelligence? Robotics, Robotics very good. I would say the use of technology to solve tasks that are usually referred to to require intelligence. Yes, it's intelligent behavior, very good. So robotics, intelligent behavior, any other keywords? Placement of expert systems. Expert systems, yeah, very good. Any other ideas, keywords? Yes? Machine learning, yes, 
another very important key term. So we have already some of the uh, key terms which are widely used when talking about artificial intelligence. So, and here you um, can see some of the things that you say, uh, you have already mentioned. So one thing about artificial intelligence, there is no universal definition of artificial intelligence. And the way this term artificial intelligence concept is used, uh, that is kind of umbrella term and uh, which covers many of those terms that you already mentioned, such as, for example, machine learning, algorithms, autonomous systems, and other uh, concepts. And here um, you can see also word cloud, uh, which, uh, what comes out when you put different artificial intelligence uh, definitions. And this word cloud comes from House of Lords uh, report, which was published in this spring about artificial intelligence in UK. And what you see in the, this word cloud are really words that you also mentioned and that are usually mentioned, such as machine, human, computer, learned tasks. And uh, when you look uh, in different um, uh, technical reports and also policy reports, you can find a plenty of ways how artificial intelligence is um, defined. So if you look also on different policy reports, we find many different definitions. So this is uh, again one of UK policy definitions coming from House of Lords uh, that says that AI systems today usually have the uh, capacity to learn or adapt to new experiences and, or stimuli. So, uh, also, concept of learning is very, very important. And if we look on uh, how European Union defines artificial intelligence in its uh, um, policy documents, so here we come to what Lucas mentioned, intelligent behavior. Uh, so European Commission uh, defines artificial intelligence as a systems that display intelligent behavior by analyzing the environment and taking actions with some degree of autonomy to achieve specific goals. And these AI systems, they can be either software based, uh, so all kinds of voice assistants, image analysis, software search engines, or it can also be embedded in hardware dev devices, such as, for example, robots, autonomous cars, drones. So uh, many different ways, where, uh, many different uh, applications where artificial intelligence is used. And as I already mentioned, artificial intelligence is very, very much contested. There are many discussions, what is good, what is bad about artificial intelligence, and how it can be used in beneficial ways, and how it can also be uh, avoided all kinds of problematic and malicious uses of artificial intelligence. And so let's look at some of uh, potential benefits, but then also on some of concerns about artificial intelligence. Uh, so when people talk about using artificial intelligence for good, using uh, artificial for intelligence for societal benefits, so AI is sometimes portrayed as a new technology which provides opportunities uh, to uh, solve many of pressing societal challenges and problems today. Uh, and some of uh, policy, big policy concepts which are used in such discussions are sustainable development goals and also grand societal challenges and missions. So let's start with sustainable development goals. What are sustainable development goals? So you get some, uh, already some indication what they are. So they come from United Nations. They were adopted in 2015. Uh, and uh, these are 17 goals that uh, United Nations have set for 2013 uh, that all countries should achieve. And these are very broad social goals relating, for example, to fighting poverty, fighting hunger, also improving um, education, improving uh, gender equality, also issues such as, for example, environment, climate change. So this very broad, very encompassing big goals and ideas that United Nations and also other international and civil society uh, organizations are promoting that we have to think how this big, new, power uh, powerful technology, artificial intelligence, can be used uh, really to solve some of these major sustainable development goals. 
And uh, so sustainable development goals come from the United Nations and they are across all policy fields. Uh, what we have in European Union, we have societal challenges and we have missions. When we talk about European Union's research and innovation policy, uh, so societal challenges, sometimes also called grand uh, challenges or global challenges, uh, they are part of EU research and innovation policy and currently they are one of pillars of Horizon 2020 program, uh, which is also a program that is at the moment funding a human brain project. And the Horizon 2020 program has three main pillars. So first pillar is excellent science, uh, then there is pillar of industrial leadership and then there is pillar of societal challenges, and uh, it supports seven societal challenges. These include challenges you can see such as health, food security, energy, transport, climate, and also challenges related to societies such as inclusive, innovative, and reflective societies, and also secure societies in Europe. Uh, so this is at the moment, uh, which is on the agenda of European research and innovation policy, and for the next funding, period after 2020, there are new ideas about missions, how research and innovation funding uh, can be used to achieve and solve certain missions. And then again, a question for artificial intelligence is how these new powerful tools coming from artificial intelligence can be used to address these societal challenges and also address missions. Uh, so these are big overarching goals. But under these big overarching goals, there are also a number of other ideas how artificial intelligence can be used for good, for benefit of society, and you can see some of them here. So one very important is the idea that it is economic growth for all. So not only for some, not only for some big companies which are very much driving uh, development of artificial intelligence, uh, but uh, that these economic goals coming from artificial intelligence are distributed across society, across different countries and across different regions. Uh, because one of idea uh, behind artificial intelligence, so if it is developing well, then it should increase overall wealth, it kind of should increase overall size of the pie of public goods, and then the question is how to distribute it in a way that everyone benefits. Then another idea that, uh, about potential positive benefits of artificial intelligence is that it can create situation when humans have more interesting and more creative jobs because all boring, dangerous jobs will be done by robots. So humans won't anymore uh, have to do these boring, repetitive and dangerous jobs. And if humans will be left to do these very interesting and creative jobs. Then uh, another idea is that um, artificial intelligence can also lead to more personalized services that are, for example, education that you get, also health uh, services that you get, that they are more personalized, more adjusted to your specific needs. Uh, Another thing is that it can increase human capabilities. So if somebody has some disabilities, some kind of problems, then artificial intelligence can help. And it can also be used for uh, political purposes to facilitate inclusion of all kinds of marginalized groups, uh, to in uh, in uh, increase democratic participation and also empowerment. So there is many ideas how it can be used for good, but that is only one side because there are also very major concerns about artificial intelligence and all kinds of uh, very problematic aspects that can follow from it. And some of these things are kind of mirror images of some of things uh, mentioned before. And one of the biggest debates coming from artificial intelligence and robotics is about future of jobs and future of uh, labor market. Uh, because uh, these concerns that many jobs might be replaced by robots. And uh, as we saw in this positive side, there is this idea that humans will be left to do more interesting and creative jobs. But there is also actually concerns that many humans, because of artificial intelligence and because of robotics, will be, will be left with no jobs at all. Uh, so major concerns about 
unemployment and alienation. And here you can see, you probably everyone has heard many different uh, um, est estimations, many different forecasts, how many jobs will be lost because of uh, robots and because of artificial intelligence. And this is uh, one uh, of estimates, which is coming from Citigroup and World Bank. And what is interesting about this estimate? So when you look on this, what is specific about this? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That it actually is uh, concern coming here is that it, uh, artificial intelligence can even increase existing inequalities. That those countries which are really less developed in Asia and Africa, that they will lose much more jobs than uh, developed than OECD countries. So we see you know, OECD countries might lose, uh, according to these estimates, one third, half of jobs, while in uh, less developed countries it could be like two thirds of jobs might be lost. And so this is additional concern. Uh, also how this technology will affect things on the global level. So jobs, yeah? When it says automation, what does this really entail? Because this could be anything from saying, if you have a car factory right now and you have robots working already assembling cars, so how far, what extent does automation in this context mean? So replacing any job that could virtually be done by a machine, having it replaced by AI, or what do they mean when they say automate? Yes, it is very, very broad. It can be many, um, many different jobs uh, affected. Uh, for example, jobs which will be uh, affected by, uh, for example, truck drivers because of autonomous cars. Many fact uh, factory jobs will be replaced by robots. But then also many other jobs like accountants, the jobs or many other might be replaced because of artificial intelligence. So it's very broad and it can affect many diverse jobs. Yeah? Approximately what time span are we talking about? Approximately what time span? Um, it is uh, quite a broad time span, but we can see also these estimates for different time spans. So, this is a big, uh, as I said, jobs are very big and we see many, many of these uh, estimates using different data, different time spans, also different definitions. Uh, but this is some of, one of major concerns. But then there are also some of uh, other concerns coming uh, related to artificial intelligence. And one of concerns is about concentration of power and money. And this is also related uh, when we see who are the main players at the moment behind artificial intelligence. And we see that these are basically some of major companies and uh, that artificial intelligence might even more enforce this concentration of power and money. Then also questions about lack of transparency, uh, biases uh, b uh, built into algorithms, and also which leads to increased discrimination. Uh, we all we have heard about uh, different cases of algorithms used in uh, recruitment uh, based on gender biases and similar. So, and one of the uh, major concerns related to this algorithmic bias relates to gender and diversity. And yesterday we already heard a lot about gender and diversity and talking about AI algorithms and also robots. Uh, there are major concerns that this white male bias who, uh, who are major developers of artificial intelligence might be built in different ways, uh, discriminating women and also discriminating um, people based on their race, ethnicity, and uh, many other social demographic uh, characteristics. So here you can see some of uh, uh, concerns that have been re uh, raised about uh, discriminating on the basis of gender and other social demographic uh, characteristics. 
Uh, and there are also initiatives to counter this. Uh, for example, there are initiatives specifically supporting women in AI. Uh, and that is one way to deal with these uh, biases and with these concerns about gender and diversity in the age of artificial intelligence. Uh, then, very relevant also for this workshop on uh, where dual use is major concern is um, malicious uses of uh, artificial intelligence related, for example, to military and security sectors, uh, also misuse of technologies, also misuse of data, and that also relates to data protection and privacy. So there are major benefits expected, potential, and there are also major concerns. And we have al already also heard about major uh, scandals about development and uses of artificial intelligence. And the next question following from that is what to do about that? So what can we do? Uh, what should governments, what should international organizations do about that? So m there are many things that they can do about that. And here are some, which follows from some of questions uh, used. So there are major questions about distribution. And uh, these are political government decisions uh, about taxes, about distribution of wealth. There are questions also about investments, investments in business, in the supporting uh, beneficial development of AI, as well as uh, major investments in retraining, because uh, jobs and labor market is such an important uh, issue. So that means also major changes uh, in education, in training, in lifelong learning. Uh, also related to legislation and regulation. So how far we can use existing uh, regulation and legislation applying to new problems. Uh, that artificial intelligence raises, and how much we also need new legislative frameworks. So it's also questions about education and raising awareness uh, among society about these new technologies. And there are also questions about ethics codes. So what kind of new ethical questions is this raises and what kind of new codes are needed. So a lot of work for policymakers, for politicians, and this is also what has been happening around the world in past two years. So what we have seen is that in the past two years, many governments, also many international organizations, civil society organizations and uh, consultancies uh, have come up with their own uh, artificial intelligence strategies how to deal with uh, artificial intelligence and what to do about it politically. So this is one map which was published at the uh, beginning of this year. So some half a year ago. And uh, it uh, demonstrates some of artificial intelligence which have been uh, adopted in different parts of the world and also which are under preparation. So we see it kind of uh, covers many continents, many regions. What is interesting about this map, uh, which also tells something about how policy, uh, policy on artificial intelligence uh, develops, is that uh, half a year later, and even a couple of months after it's uh, it was published, this map was already outdated. Because um, it tells something about the speed with which artificial intelligence policy develops. Uh, so at the moment, there's new artificial intelligence strategy published basically every week, at least one a week. And some weeks, we get two or three new artificial policy uh, documents uh, launched and coming out. So this shows that there is a lot of attention. Um, and we can just think about some uh, of documents which were published after this map came out. So it was published around uh, February, and then in, uh, in spring we got also artificial intelligence strategy from France, from Emmanuel Macron. We got our artificial intelligence strategy from European Commission. Uh, we got the UK House of Lords strategy. And uh, then in summer we also got the uh, national artificial intelligence strategy from India and many others. And, uh, about this time in mid-November, there should also be uh, Germany should publish it, uh, its artificial intelligence strategy. So there's a lot, a lot of attention, and the question is why? Uh, why suddenly? Yeah. 
yeah, we will come to US. US was actually one of the first. It was in October 2016. It was still Obama administration. So we will come also back to US, but uh, I was just uh, uh, focusing on those which were in 2018, but there were also countries which started already in 2016 and 2017. Uh, so, and question is why, uh, why so, uh, so much in uh, attention? So one thing is because there are major technological developments uh, enabled by increased computing power, enabled by increased uh, availability of data. Um, so, and these developments are very much uh, driven by large multinational co uh, corporations, but because they affect uh, people in so many different ways, so also policymakers and politicians uh, should get involved uh, and uh, address these uh, concerns. Uh, that is one thing. And another thing is that there have been also some interesting developments at in, uh, international level. And one uh, major international forum when, uh, where all these developments have been discussed uh, is World Economic Forum. So World Economic Forum where, uh, in Davos, where every year all main policy makers, all main uh, thinkers and influencers think about uh, these uh, questions of major developments in the world. And uh, one of the uh, concepts that come from this um, World Economic Forum is this idea of fourth industrial revolution. So founder and executive chairman of uh, uh, World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab, he has published this book, the, uh, Fourth Industrial Revolution, where he argues that there have been three uh, previous industrial revolutions and now we are experiencing fourth one. So by first, he means uh, end of 18th century, beginning of 19th century, and that relates to railroad, steam engine, and mechanical production, uh, which was followed by second in the late um, 19th century, early 20th century, which was about mass production, electricity, assembly line. And then a third was in 1960s when it started with uh, computer, uh, computers and digital revolution and then developed also in 70s and uh, 90s with internet. And then from 2000, he argues it is fourth industrial revolution, which is fusion of technologies across physical, digital and biological domains and artificial intelligence plays a major role here. So and uh, there is uh, also important uh, when we think about this idea of fourth industrial revolution, uh, it's also important to consider that it came out in the context of World Economic Forum and that this book and these ideas, uh, they have also been very influential in shaping political thinking about changes which are happening in the world. Um, and for example, this idea of fourth industrial revolution in UK, you can hear it quite a lot. It's used in UK policy discourses also by civil society organizations and possibly also in other countries uh, you can come across this idea of forced industrial revolution. And so there is this um, idea of forced industrial revolution and question is of course what to do about it. So how to approach uh, it. And then in this book, at the end of this book, Klaus Schwab who came up with this idea of fourth industrial revolution. He suggests his way of addressing it. And so uh, his idea is how do you uh, deal with this? Uh, that you use four different types of intelligence. So he defines this as contextual, emotional, inspired, and physical um, types of um, intelligence where contextual intelligence relates to your mind, how we understand and, and apply our knowledge, emotional in, uh, intelligence he associates with heart, so how we process and uh, integrate our thoughts and feelings and relate to ourselves and to one another. Uh, third is inspired, so about our sense of individual and shared purpose and trust. And physical is about our bodies and about our 
getting our personal health and well-being so that we are able to deal with all those changes. And at the end uh, he, uh, of the book, he also uh, talks about new cultural renaissance. So these are a number of ideas. So what do you think? Would these ideas be sufficient? Would they, be, would they solve all the major challenges that artificial intelligence poses to? Malcolm says no. No. Yeah. Why not? It takes no account of the power differentials which are driving mm -hmm. the revolution. Yeah. Yeah. Others are nodding. If he yeah. says cultural, this sounds to me that he's more interested in actual, you know, the attitude towards it and less than mm -hmm. coining it in the sense of actual policy. This mm -hmm. sounds to me more that it's about an actual, you know, uh, mi more mindful thinking about it, but not mm -hmm. really in a sense that you could apply this to, say, policy making, actual, or, you know, converted to industry. So this sounds to me more like a new way of thinking about it rather than really, how would you apply this in the actual AI industry, say? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I don't know what this looks like. It's a bit like blaming all the problem of you lose onto scientists. Right. Without right. Thinking at all about the context of yeah. which scientists were. Okay. Uh, indeed, these are mm, exactly very, very relevant points because all these things they are either um, focusing on individual level, like our attitudes, which are of course important, and also this uh, new cultural renaissance. It's also a lot about norms and values. But indeed, there are major questions about politics, about policies, about governance, and uh, about power structures, and about more, uh, more systematic and more macro level approach. So it's not saying that this is bad. This could be part of a bigger approach. But for this bigger approach, we need also this uh, uh, political and governance and legal instruments. Yes. Does he touch on any of that in this book? I, I, I don't know the book, so does he touch on any of the governance and policy issues, or is this his final statement, so to speak, or does he actually touch on that? Uh, he talks also, uh, because the book is also World Economic Forum, it's also to the major world leaders, uh, so I would suggest if you want to get a better idea, also have a look at this book. Uh, definitely so and this comes out at the very end as a final statement so this is a kind of big final statement and that's why uh, we want to go also and look uh, after this final statement to look more into macro level politics and policies and governance issues and as I mentioned uh, this uh, many governments and many or, uh, international organizations around the world uh, are addressing in their national strategies uh, these questions of power, of distribution, of support, uh, and uh, all kinds of regula uh, regulatory and ethical questions that artificial intelligence ra uh, raises. And at the, at the Montfort University, uh, for the past half a year or a little bit longer, uh, we are doing project um, research project by analyzing uh, these policy documents. Uh, what, how do they understand artificial intelligence? Uh, what kind of expectations they present about the benefits and risks of artificial intelligence. So we have a team, also Winter is part of our AI policy analysis team. And here are some very initial uh, insights which come from this work of uh, comparing uh, artificial intelligence documents. Because another very interesting question uh, is what are differences if all countries approximately at the same time come out with all these AI policy documents? Uh, so what are differences? What are similarities? Do we see convergence or do we see also diversity? And just say very briefly, we see both. We see similarities, but we also see some very important differences, which we will uh, address uh, in the next couple of minutes. So, but uh, some of common uh, themes, some of similarities that we see again and again and again and again is that in many policy documents, many countries and many international organizations uh, depict artificial intelligence as revolutionary, transformative and uh, disruptive emerging technology. 
So there's also a lot of competition and collaboration going on in this field, and we will come to that in a minute. And basically, uh, one of common trends is that in all these documents, in all these policy approaches, we can see kind of these three pillars, what policymakers want to do about it. So they want to facilitate beneficial outcomes. So to think about how these uh, um, artificial intelligence can help in solving rather than exaggerating grand societal challenges and sustainable development goals. Uh, then also, second pillar is very much about managing risks and reducing negative effects. So all these things such as retraining, reskilling, um, labor force. And third is about ensuring responsibilities, uh, questions about responsible research and innovations that you heard a lot about yesterday, about participation, empowerment, and also new forms of ethical governance. And as an example of these um, ideas that come up in policy documents, uh, I would like to give some insights in, uh, from European Commission's uh, communication on artificial intelligence in Europe, which was pu uh, published this spring. And some of the ide ideas that European Commission, how European Commission presents and wants to deal with artificial intelligence. So, uh, in this document, artificial intelligence is framed as one of the most strategic industries of 21st century and compared with these previous industrial revolutions. So like a steam engine or uh, electricity in the past, artificial intelligence is transforming our world, our society and our industry. And uh, here also European uh, Commission sees artificial intelligence as a way to tackle of some of these grand societal challenges, like treating chronic diseases, reducing fatality rates in traffic accidents, and fighting climate change and uh, anticipating cybersecurity risks. So many expectations. How European Union uh, plans to do this? So we see this three pillar structure very clearly. So first, European Union wants to boost the EU's technological and industrial capacity and facilitate AI uptake across the economy. So invest more and in make sure that it's not only investments in big companies, in major research centers, but it is across all economies that it also touches upon, for example, small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, then it is about uh, preparing for social economic changes, so all these things like uh, leaving no one behind, so it's all about retraining people. Uh, and uh, the third very important is about this ensuring an appropriate ethical and legal framework. And at the moment major work is going on in developing um, uh, AI ethics guidelines, which should be published soon, very soon. Um, so this is uh, a short insight in EU, but as we already touched upon, EU is not on the only one who is in uh, this field. There are many countries. And what we see emerging is kind of global competition. And also we can say it's kind of new global race. And some people even uh, compare it to space race, to moon race. So who will be the first, who will be the best? And uh, here are just some examples. So as I mentioned, one of the first countries which came up with its AI national strategy was US, which happened already during Obama administration in October 2016. And in this document, US said that US is a leader in AI, R&D, and can, uh, can continue to play a key role in global research coordination. So US already is a leader. Then last summer, China came out with its strategy and its ambition is to become world's primary AI innovation center by 2030. So major developments are taking place in China. And then this year also UK and France announced that they want to become leaders. And interestingly enough, uh, also European uh, Commission in its documents that I just mentioned uh, also announced its plan to become a leader in the AI revolution in its own way and based on its own values. Uh, so we see there is a race on and there are 
two interesting questions, at least two, but let's stick to two. Uh, so is this race, is this competition on global level, is it a good thing or not so good? That's one question. And the question is about EU. When EU says that it wants to be a leader based on its values, what are these European values? And let's look at both of these uh, questions. So first of all, is this global competition good thing or not? Any ideas? Should countries compete? Who will be the best in AI? I guess you can say really generally that competition spices up the business, but you know, this can go real wrong real fast. So I guess it's always depending on you know how how far people are willing to go and what with the EU saying based on its values, this isn't somewhat lacking in the other statements. I wonder, you know, if that's actually, you know, if, the, the, if that's deliberate or if because that sounds like all right, we want to be a leader, no matter the cost, or let's not talk about the cost. We'll we'll just see because we want to be the leader. So does China, so does UK, so does France, so does the EU. Mm -hmm. So who's going to end up on top? And the only one saying that mm -hmm. we still stick to the values is the EU statement. So. Yeah. Okay. Good. Surely what stands out from that list is uh, for those that have, more shall be given. And for mm -hmm. those that have not, even that, that they have shall be taken away. Mm -hmm. Where are the poor countries here? Mm -hmm. And how is this race going to affect the people who are at the bottom? Mm -hmm. Yes. Who are so, according to the previous slide, are going to be most affected in terms of the impact on people. So, looking at, at that, I would say that you don't like the look of where it's going to go because it's going to, the gap between the rich and the poor even greater. Yes. So, as you already indicated, competition might have some positive uh, effects, but it also raises some very, very important concerns and um, questions. And uh, when we think about positives, there might be some kind of mobilization of resources, some kind of uh, um, uh, building on a momentum and doing something more and motivating to do something more and better. There might be some positive effects, but there are also some uh, very important concerns and questions about this global race. Because one thing is competition among companies uh, in business sector, but other thing is competition of, uh, among countries. Because basically what uh, this kind of discourse does, it says that competition among countries in technology is kind of zero-sum game where one country uh, gains and other countries, uh, all others lose. And the question, is it really a zero-sum game? Can it also be positive-sum game? So if the uh, idea of AI and new technologies is that they can uh, make a size of uh, pie bigger for everyone, so it can actually be that uh, done in a way that everyone benefits. There shouldn't be one leader, there should be all countries um, kind of collaborating and um, also making sure that it benefits everyone. And another question here is um, uh, related to competition. Um, it is important to keep in mind what uh, Paul Krugman wrote already in '94 that uh, competition can be a dangerous obsession, that it can um, a competition among countries because it might lead to uh, spending resources in a certain way rather than maybe some uh, focusing on these uh, big attractive things like artificial intelligence and forgetting about investing and thinking about uh, other socially important areas. Areas. And that might go back to uh, old 1970s debate about Moon and the Ghetto. So every, all countries were competing, who will be the best, uh, the first to go to the Moon, uh, while at the same time, like, uh, problems of the Ghetto were largely um, uh, not solved, and there was no kind of global race, who will be the first country to solve the problems of the Ghetto. And so this is very important to keep in uh, the mind when thinking of, about AI. Is it really just who will be the leader or is it really done in a socially beneficial way across all countries, across all regions?
So that's the first question about competition. And the second question was about European values. So European Union wants to do it according to its values. What are European values? Ideas? What are European values? Non-discrimination, so, non yeah. And as we also um, already saw yesterday in this debate about RRI, that responsible research and innovation is about adjusting research to societal needs and values, and that it's very difficult to agree in society on main values. So uh, there are important value questions. When we think about European values, why I also asked Simi about the legal approach, uh, so there are some European values which we can find in some of the major legal documents about the European Union. And here are two. So one is Lisbon Treaty, which is the most recent treaty of the European Union, uh, which was adopted in 2007 and became uh, effective in 2009, so some 10 years ago. And uh, when we read the first article of this treaty, we see that there are some uh, European values. So uh, this treaty says that the European Union is founded on the values of respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, respect for human rights, including rights of persons belonging to minorities. And so there are also these principles on non-discrimination, tolerance, justice, solidarity, equality uh, between men and uh, women uh, that should prevail. And another document uh, with some similar values is Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, which was ratified in 2000. And here also at the beginning of this charter, uh, it says that the Union is founded on the universal values of human dignity, freedom, equality and solidarity and based on principles of demo um, democracy and rule of law. So we see that some of these values come again in both uh, uh, times. It's about human dignity, about freedom, equality, and solidarity. In this Charter of uh, Fundamental Rights, there is this very interesting idea of universal values. And um, we don't have time to discuss it at the moment. Uh, but basically, this is also very much discussed, do we have? Uh, universal values are these values of uh, uh, human dignity, freedom, and solidarity as a universal, or are all values like more uh, context specific? Uh, that goes back to what Simi said how does it apply to outside the European Union? So, these are very, very important questions. How what kind of values are built in artificial intelligence, uh, what are European values and other universal values or uh, how values also differ around the world. So that's about competition. There is not only com uh, competition in this area, there is also cooperation. And uh, Can I ask a question uh, going back to your previous slide? Yes. <laughs> that was sounds all very nice, but the question is how are those principles translated into the ethics questionnaires that you have to um, fill up when you make an application for a grant mm -hmm. to the European Union. Yeah. Uh, and it's quite clear, having sat on some of those um, ethics committees, mm -hmm. that Sometimes it can be very powerful if, if, the, if the ethics questions are very precise and if the people on the committee know what they're talking about. But it's also the case, for instance, that many people making applications, big institutions making applications, don't even realize that there are ethics questions. Yeah. That, uh, they don't fill the ethics form up because they don't think there are any ethics. Mm -hmm. So it's very much a matter of how effectively those things are translated into the ethics questions which determine where the money goes. Exactly. And you raise some of the very, very big um, questions because these are values and then we have ethics questionnaires which are a bit standardized. And one can ask how far you can translate these big values in standardized ethics questionnaires. 
Uh, and uh, another question, which also comes especially with dual use research and technology, is also about tension between different values. For example, tension between academic freedom and security. So there are major questions, and uh, we might leave them for a break. OK. And as I said, uh, in uh, all new technologies and what we see also in artificial intelligence, there's competition, there's cooperation, and in many cases we see actually that uh, cooperation and competition is very intertwined. We already know from Robert Merton from 1942, in, uh, he mentions this um, term competi uh, competitive cooperation, which we also see happening a lot uh, uh, in Europe, among companies, among universities, and also among uh, countries, that the same countries are at the same time collaborating as well as uh, competing. And in Europe, for example, all countries signed um, uh, declaration about uh, collaborating on artificial intelligence uh, in April this year, uh, uh, some joined later, but uh, now all countries are participating and that we see this very interesting dynamics of collaboration and competition. And so to sum up all these um, big questions uh, that we have discussed in a very fast and not always uh, with a chance to go very deeply in them. Uh, so. First of all, we see that there are major developments happening on AI policy in the past two years. So, and in, in these uh, documents, we see very interesting interplay between technology, between business, and between politics. And we see that also major, uh, international forums, such as World Economic Forum, play a major role. Uh, we see that there is some hype in policy framing artificial intelligence as revolutionary, transformative, and disruptive, uh, and that influences decision-making and resource allocation in this area. Uh, we see that there is global competition on collaboration, which might have positive as well as some challenging and problematic effects, uh, and uh, that includes questions such as, is technology, uh, technological competition a zero-sum game or a positive-sum game? Uh, when does competitiveness discourse become dangerous and counterproductive? And who is left out of collaborations? And what are kind of uh, emerging and reinforced divides in development of artificial intelligence? And we see that there is policy and governance uh, which can play a crucial role ensuring responsibility and representation. Then I uh, promised you a movie, and I have three movies uh, which are produced by uh, researchers at University of Cambridge. And they are very interesting movies on good in the machine, pain in the machine, and friend in the machine. And so, uh, soon there should be one final fourth movie. Uh, but uh, I have a question to Abdul about time. Uh, because I wanted to show this first movie, Good in the Machine, which is mostly about ethics of AI. But that movie is 15 minutes. We would be in coffee break. Maybe we should leave people to watch the movies at home. Yeah. OK, I, I'm very sorry I didn't live up to my promise, but because we had uh, interesting things to discuss. So I really suggest, uh, I think slides will be made uh, available. And you can also, you can just go to YouTube and look up Good in the Machine, Pain in the Machine, and Friend in the Machine. And uh, every of these movies is some 10 to 15 minutes. And I very, very much uh, suggest, and I apologize that we didn't have it. Um, OK, or uh, when we go into coffee break, I can put it up, and uh, yeah. people can get a coffee and come and watch it. Yeah. And so very final words. So this is a lot about responsible. Uh, research and innovation, all this workshop. And you heard a lot about these ideas uh, of anticipating, reflecting, in engaging, and acting. And this could be also a framework to think about future uses of artificial intelligence. And this is also something that we use in Human Brain Project and that we are also considering for our future activities in uh, Human Brain Project to address artificial intelligence. And just to keep up with what we are doing uh, on artificial intelligence, on RRI, and other things. Uh, so we have a number of ways we distribute our information. Uh, we have recently, last month, we launched new blog, Essex Dialogues, uh, which updates on all recent activities. And we also plan to prepare a um, blog post on this workshop here, which should come out soon. So 
uh, you can read a blog and learn what we do and also engage with us. And we also have a Twitter account, HPP Essex Support. And if you have any questions, you can contact me. So thank you very much for your attention and your engagement.